the Tuscarora's Philharmonic and the Tuscarora's Philharmonic Chorus uh, have been working on the great St. Matthew Passion of Johann Sebastian Bach for presentation on March 24th. And um, we're preparing you by means of this pre-concert video uh, chat about uh, the music and about the passion and about Bach. And I invited my friend here, Dr. Susan Haddock, is, uh, is one of my colleagues at the University of Mount Union, where she's associate professor of religious studies. She's also a formidable musician. She plays organ and sings in her church, and she's a member of our violin section, an esteemed member of the violin section. So I thought, Susan, I wanted to hear uh, some of your perspective as a religious scholar, particularly on um, the music of Bach and uh, on the passion. I want to begin, though, with my own experience with this music, I heard it first, the opening chorus, in the context of a Sunday school class I was in, when I was in my 20s, and I was just arrested by that opening chorus. What was the first time you heard it? Actually, my first experience with this piece was the last time we played it in the Tuscarora Philharmonic, mm -hmm. about five years you ago. You hadn't known it before? No, that. although I have been playing Bach since I was five, but uh, not that piece. So, Minuet and G. Yeah. Yes. Right, yes. sure. Mm -hmm. just, uh, but, but this, the, the, that opening chorus, it made a profound effect on me. Uh, and, and then, not too long after that, I had the opportunity uh, on a good Friday afternoon to hear the passion narrative, I think it was the St. John passion story, uh, not read, sort of as theater, but chanted, where it, it, it takes the personal voice out of it. It's not me trying to dramatically render this text or, or whoever was up there reading. But instead, there was a kind of an impassive quality to it as it's simply chanted on certain tones and moves around and is reflected. And of course, this is a long tradition in, in the church. Any idea when they would have started doing that sort of well, thing? Well, chanting was early on because that's how you get the voice to project through those long cathedrals rather than speaking tone, the chanting tone. So, so then the chant would have been simply a way of making the text heard and mm -hmm. understood. Uh, oh, I see. But what thing it does is it, it takes out the individual delivery and just lets the words speak for themselves. And I, you know, I, I, I like personal emotion and personal experience as much as anybody, but there was something majestic and uh, kind of austere in just letting those words speak out that way, in, inflected just by these chant melodies, uh, that had a profound effect on me as well. And, uh, uh, you know, I suddenly saw how important that text was uh, and, and why it was treated that way. What's the, what's the backstory on that as far as, the, you know, the story of the passion in the context? Yeah. Well, clearly the passion is the central story in Christianity, the passion and the, the resurrection. But in terms of the Gospels on which Bach's passion is, is very closely based, if you look at the the life of Jesus that they're telling is about a three-year ministry, generally. Matthew and Luke put in a birth story, but there's a there's not much about Jesus until Jesus actually starts his ministry. Um, so that's about a three-year span. The Passion itself is only a week long, and then from, say, the Last Supper through Jesus' crucifixion, we're talking about 24 hours. But in terms of the textual space, the Passion takes up about half the gospel narrative, so we can see the clear focus um, of that event. I've never thought about that, just in terms of, as it were, pages devoted <laughs> to, uh, out of the whole story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly then. And we get quite a lot of detail, interaction, yes. Peter interacting with, with the, in, in the St. Matthew version, you get the, Peter interacting with two maids, nameless mm -hmm. women, who you know, who forced it, but well, uh, the, the, let's see, how to set it up so that you wind up denying, de de yes. denying, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we get that, that much detail in the direction, or, 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 or uh, 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 Judas' uh, betrayal and all that. So, yeah, so there's that much detail in it, and uh, obviously, it's a, cause it's a clearly very important story, even in, in, in all these narratives. So the tradition then of using it liturgically is kind of a dramatic piece, but based obviously long before Bach. Yes. Yeah, and, and the Passion, the week of the Passion and Easter was the highlight of the church year. In contemporary America, we put a lot of emphasis on Christmas. Yeah. Uh, but um, theologically, 
the Passion and Easter are the most important events. And so historically, that's where you get most of this. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We perform Handel's Messiah, and nobody thinks everything. It's fine to do it at Christmas time, right. but who would come if we did it at Easter? <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we are doing the, the, the Passion according to Saint Matthew of Johann Sebastian Bach, and we're performing it on Palm Sunday afternoon. I'm really delighted that we can be, that we can have this kind of timing. Obviously, it fits in with, with where people are in their in their in their sort of religious life in the calendar. Uh, now, Bach, living from 1685, died in 1750, so here we are, early 18th century, and he's setting it to music. But in the, in the St. Matthew Passion, we're not getting just the words of Matthew set to music. Talk about, about what else is going on in the piece. Yeah. yeah, so Bach pretty closely follows the text, the gospel text, but he also adds in arias and chorales that form the response of the individual singer or representing the congregate to the text. So you have the sense of the text and this devotional response to it, kind of like we do in Bible studies, you know? But, yeah, yeah, right, you get the... Personalize the, the text. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and the, 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 somehow the, 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 it, it creates, you know, this sort of personal meaning mm -hmm. of, of this, and even sometimes wrenching it a little out of context mm -hmm. in order to make the personal right. meaning, or, or not. And I find very often that the wordplay, as it were, in, in the St. Matthew Passion, it's very affecting. Uh, when Bach sets um, the, uh, when, when, when the passage in, the, in St. Matthew where Jesus says, one of you will betray me, and the, he, uh, Bach has the chorus singing, uh, is it I? Only we use the, in the translation we're using, it's Lord, not I. Lord, not I, because is it I is a little hard to say. And incidentally, in, in Bach setting, it happens 11 times, mm -hmm. 11 times, because right. and, and Judas has his own time <laughs> right, saying, right, right, right. So, so Bach, you know, the musical brilliance of it is that, is that he's able to make it work musically mm -hmm. and come out to only 11 times. Well, okay, so, uh, and then immediately he turns it around after that little episode of Is It I, Is It I, Is It I, takes us out of the narrative and we sing the chorale, uh, uh, Tis I, Lord. Mm -hmm. is what we sing. In fact, we sing the Passion Chorale. Yes, and that's part of the liturgical setting is to bring the congregation into the text. It's not just then and there, but these are events, these are meanings that are here and now. So the congregation is responding to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then what yeah, else? So in the original, when you wrote it, you wrote it for the Good Friday service which would start about 1.30, but they would start with a hymn that everybody sang and then performed the first half of the Passion. Then there would be a lengthy sermon in the middle. And then they would perform the second half and do another hymn and some prayers and uh, the offering afterwards. So it was quite the, the whole afternoon. It might have been a six-hour kind of thing, yeah. Or even... Keeping vigil, in a sense. Yeah, no, right, right. And the now, I'm aware of this word pietism, that it was a movement in the church that Bach was perhaps, well, certainly was familiar with. Uh, tell us about pietism. Yeah, so Bach was a Lutheran, which um, uh, Martin Luther lived about 200 years before Bach. Um, so it was already established in, in Germany. And the, and the pietists thought that, that Martin Luther hadn't quite gone far enough in his Reformation. Uh, they saw some of the same issues that Martin Luther had with uh, church hierarchy and with uh, formality, but they thought that he stopped too soon. So they want to go a little bit further, get rid of most of the ritual elements, including arty music. They weren't fond of that. They, really? they wanted um, congregational simple tunes that people could connect to mm. rather than ornate Baroque style music that, of course, Bach likes. So um, in a sense, Bach did not like the, the, the lack of formalism of the Pietists, but their idea that you should have a personal relationship with God, it should be an individual experience, it was this emphasis on personal piety, which is where we get that right. term, pietism, that was very attractive But, but even an emotional yes, part, emotional. Mm -hmm. that, and that, that the emotional was an important component. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough to simply sort of say the words of the creed, especially given a musical setting in the creed, mm -hmm. That, that had to be something more to it. Yeah. Well, we, we certainly find that in, in, in churches today. Or yeah, yeah we still have those same kind of conflicts and, and criticisms of 
the two sides, one side says this side's too formal, there's no personal connection, and the other side says you guys are just way out there. Yeah, you have no theology at all. Well. Well. Right. Right. As long as you cry, it's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think Bach did a good job of balancing those two. Yeah, how do we know anything about Bach and his, and his religious beliefs? Yeah, it's always interesting trying to get into somebody's head several hundred years later, right? Yeah. So I mean, you can play the music and sort of right. think you're intuiting something. Yeah, I, mean, I think we do get some of that because he did put a lot of his faith into his music. And still since that, that's why it's still so powerful. Mm -hmm. But we do have a record, when he died, they made a list of his uh, library and all the books that we had in it. And most of his books were uh, religious books, were theological books. He had a couple of different copies of the Bible. Uh, he had a couple of different commentaries on the Bible. He had works of Orthodox Lutheran theologians, and he had a few works from the Pietists. Um, he liked their ideas, even if he argued against their view of church music. And we actually have found his personal copies of one of these commentaries. In the United States, we found it. It was missing for a couple hundred years and turned up, and, and somebody found this book in their family's collection and huh. brought it to Concordia Seminary, and there was Bach's monogram in the front. Right. And he'd notated many things on the side on this commentary. He, and he particularly underlined portions and wrote comments about the musical parts in the biblical text. Uh, descriptions of one of them, he said, oh look, uh, oh look, what's <laughs> 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 He said, here we see the first use of a double chorus between Miriam and Moses after the Red Sea. They're singing to each other, and we see that double chorus in the Passion as well, so we had biblical basis for his style. Right, so uh, the, the people watching this may not be aware, Bach actually splits the chorus in half at certain points and has them uh, uh, opposing each other or calling back and forth to each other and to orchestras. And so he's looking in the Bible for justification for musical practice, even mm -hmm. to that point. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, of course, he was probably doing it also to sort of counter the Pietist mm -hmm. view that that the, the, you have to get rid of all that fancy music. Right, stuff. and then he noted the places where it specifically mentioned instrumental music, which was viewed somewhat suspiciously because how can you have meaning without text? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. right, right. No, it, not in the in the in the narrative passages. Uh, there's some, but particularly, of course, in the in the arias, the solo songs, and in some of the choral pieces that are inserted on uh, text. Um, Bach didn't write the text. It was uh, Picander. That was his pen name. His last name was Henrici, which sounds Italian, but he was actually German, a lawyer, and living in Leipzig. And Bach and he partnered on these things, and he 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 created text for Bach to to set then and. And yeah, and these arias and duets and choruses, and the music, it, the, the, the lyric is very personalized. Mm -hmm. It takes the appropriating, uh, as you suggested already, the, 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 the event of the gospel that you're, in the narrative and, and, and turning it inward as well and sort of making a personal application. Um, and, you know, there's, there's something, it, it's interesting that the pietists are trying to get rid of the formality, get rid of ritual, get rid of a framework, as it were. And, and Bach splits the difference beautifully between the, the intensely emotional personal experience that doesn't have, let's say, a lot of framework. I think you recognize the importance of liturgy and structure. One of the things that it does is it ties across time to previous congregations who've used the same liturgy. Um, and across space to other congregations that are using the same thing. So it, and, and then the way he puts in the arias with the more emotional, the devotional, it, 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 it creates this tension and this balance between the individual and the community, between structure and emotion, reason and emotion, you might say. So it's a very uh, a fuller picture of faith, I think. Yeah. I've been, as we've been working with the chorus, uh, I've been taking a bit more of a, of a, of a more a different approach to the hymns, the hymns, the chorales. Uh, you know, and of course the most popular one that occurs in five different settings, five times Bach writes the, the reharmonizes and uh, the, the famous Passion Chorale, the one we all know is of Sacred Head Not Wounded. Um, and it's a particularly beautiful melody. Uh, but actually it wasn't a hymn to begin with, right? No, it was a love song, which is very interesting. But I think it brings in that element of, of emotion to 
it's you yeah. said it was passion. Yeah, yeah, and and so it was originally a secular song and a love song, right? And then and then it acquired this attachment to the uh, to the the passion narrative. Uh, I the, there's a sort of a formality about him singing, you know, the way we have to do it even in churches today, or it, it, it's it, we changed it out a bit because of amplification and guitars and popular music styles. But the traditional hymns that we all know, and we kind of sing them. All in, it's like big blocks of sounds moving, right? uh, and and that was the way I think these hymn, these these chorales were, was approached through uh, much of the nineteenth and early twentieth century. One of the things in Bach style is the the thing called a sequence. Uh, I, I know you know what a sequence is, but I'll, for, for for our friends who may not, with a repetition. Da 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 uh, same pattern, only starting on different notes. And in a way, I analogize that that pattern of repetition is a little like a strict liturgy that you have to go through. Mm -hmm. But somehow when we hear, play those repetitions in a piece by Bach, it gets you right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always thought Bach is kind of my soul healer in that sense of whenever I've, I've, I've returned to the music of Bach, especially playing Bach. Mm -hmm. um, it has a very physical quality to it. The sense of perpetual motion almost to use as um, rhythms that continue mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned the sequences that repeat. But yet within that formal structure, the, the changes he makes and the space that creates for a kind of transcendent quality, it's, it's calming and yet it also allows for transformation. Well, I think what it is, is what it, with the sequence is that you can just change a note in the, in the sequence changes the harmony, yeah. and that harmonic change somehow yeah, that makes it very emotional. Yeah. Well, he even does that on a larger scale with that five different uses of that chorale in the Passion, and they're all in a different key and slightly yeah. different, so over even the larger fourth of a piece. Right. I think about that arresting opening, the, uh, the, the opening chorus, and what we get is uh, the thing you notice right away is this grinding bass that is just pounding out a little bit which sounds portentous and just loads of literally gravity gets down and chugging away. And over the top of it are these floating lines and they're singing a text, they're singing it in English, so they're singing the text, Come ye daughters. What's that we're talking about? Well, he was talking about the daughter of Zion, uh, Jerusalem, uh, and which really sets this piece uh, in the larger biblical context. So we're not just talking about the passion narrative, but we're talking about the Old Testament scriptures, the prophetic scriptures that are, uh, from the evangelist perspective, um, foretelling the story of the Messiah and the suffering of the Messiah. So within this space, we're drawing, Bach is not only drawing the, the congregation into the story of just the passion, but the whole history and the salvation history reaching back into the past, uh -huh. which Matthew in particular emphasizes the scriptural connections. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a tremendously dramatic thing because with all that you've got going on, that pedal, what we call a pedal point, repeated note grinding away down there, and it doesn't move for, for quite a while. And when it finally does move, you get a sense of how big this is going to be because if it stays on that one note for that long and then starts to move, and then you get a sense that, that, that it's we're slow moving wheels are happening here, where at the same time you've got faster moving wheels, as it were, with these florid lines of counterpoint. And then at some points, the choir, it's just hair raising the conductor, just amazing, because one choir calls out, see him, who? And so there, it's this back and forth drama. And, and then, by the way, the orchestra split in half too, so you've got one orchestra and another orchestra accompanying both choirs. And, and then, as if that weren't enough, we have a, 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 a magical moment. And on top of all of that, the kids' chorus comes in singing, O Lamb of God, and Spawn. It's another, another chorale. And so it's this multi layering effect, and it just becomes a towering edifice of music that opens up and then goes right on into the passion narrative right after that. So it sort of sets the stage. And then there, there's this long arc. Of course, in the piece, it's in big two big sections. The final chorus, 
Now, the final two choruses, the next to the last one, the choir is singing, um, My Jesus, Sweet Good Night. It sounds like a lullaby. Mm -hmm. And, and then it finishes off the last chorus with "Hereby we still," and Bach brings it all the way, but brings us back not uh, to to a, a minor chord, lands on a C minor chord, and it's dark, rich sound, and over that though has this B natural, it's in the flutes, and a C minor chord, you know, that B natural lingers there for a moment, and then it dissolves off of the C, and just leaves you sitting there on a C minor chord, thinking about what it all means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the beauty of this liturgical placement of this piece on Good Friday and waiting throughout the, throughout throughout Saturday um, before the East, before the Easter resurrection. But he doesn't want you to get that too soon. Yeah, you need that space to linger uh, in rest and loss. You know, it, it's it's a masterpiece of music. It is one that I I still say I think it's one of the great achievements of Western culture. Is this piece the same as your passion? But clearly, he was writing for an audience, for a congregation that he was part of. Mm -hmm. it, in fact, mm -hmm. it never got performed. It didn't get performed. He only he did it. it it's not like this thing got broadcast all around. Never did it. It was only in, it, was, it was only be done while he was there, and he didn't. I don't think it necessarily affected his music to survive him. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, it waited. That's the magical story of that. It waited almost seventy years after the death of Bach for for Felix Mendelssohn to come along and. and and do this piece again. So back to my point, which is that it seems to me that he really does have very much a kind of a, the, the, uh, a spiritual caretaking, a spiritual concern for the people that we're going to be hearing in this piece. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so you sit there on a C minor chord at the end, that B natural was off to C, and you're just left to sort of think about all the events that have just transpired. You're sort of uh, with the apostles, or the, the, the disciples at the ceiling of the tomb, and now what? Sit there and just think about it for a while. Yeah. And but it's, yeah, it's not tragic either. It's not like, well, there's death. Right. That's it. Yeah. The language of sleep and the language of rest after the, the hard work of carrying the sins, uh, carrying carrying out the work of redemption right. is rest that you sit in. But yet there's a hint that there's more. There is, yeah. Oh, like what it does for me is it makes me stop and think about what all happened. Rather than mm -hmm. go rushing into, right. oh, what, there's a resurrection, don't worry, right. Right. Yeah, kind of thing, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's waiting there, uh -huh. but it's not final. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that tension we, that uh, theologians like to talk about, this tension between the already and the not yet. It's, we're in this in-between space. Well, and the cool thing about the music, though, is, of course, the listeners, the first listeners, obviously, they knew what the rest of the story mm -hmm. is, as we do. I sort of think that Bach understood that there was something good about sitting there yeah. just with the truths that you experience as part of the passion narrative, and that's it. That's all. That you just get to think about that, and that this piece makes you do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one of those great, great treasures that we can come back to. I'll look forward to this performance uh, on, on March 24th, and I've already got it on my calendar that we'll come back to this piece yet again. Maybe we'll have this conversation again five years. All right, look forward to it. <laughs> Thanks very much.